and um, thanks for coming along to my second seminar here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name's uh, Mike Morris. I'm the <coughs> Business Development Manager for Cumbria Chamber of Commerce. I'll be happy afterwards to talk to anybody about anything to do with what the Grove Club delivers, uh, what the Chamber's involvement or any of the other partners. Um, and so just come and talk to me about anything like that. Um, I just will crack on. I'd like to introduce Denise Conroy for you and um, enjoy the seminar. And uh, I hope you're enjoying the rest of your stay here at the uh, exhibition. You got something? No? It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. As mentioned, I'm Denise Conroy. Um, my company is Inglewood Hospitality. Um, and I've been asked today if I could just come along and just have a bit of a chat um, to you about pricing in general. So what I'm going to do before we go much further is just give you what I would class as my light bulb moment um, in pricing. My background is hotels, so I started off in hotels about 33 years ago, and you just kind of get on with it. There was no such thing as a pricing strategy. Nobody ever told me that that existed. I just kind of got on with it. Um, sometimes you got guidance and sometimes you didn't. I used to work in Edinburgh uh, market, and when I was in Edinburgh, I realised then that what I knew was uh, more of a, it was just something that came naturally to me and that not necessarily everybody had that. So as much as I've learned other skills along the way, this was something that just I seemed to take to. So this particular story is I worked in an Edinburgh hotel and it was about 100 rooms and the rate was about 100 pounds. So I did find them up to make it nice and simple <coughs> calculations, obviously. And it was about March time. Now in March in Edinburgh, I don't know if any of you know it, it's fairly quiet, so it tends to be busy from about April, May through to about September after the tattooing festival had finished mostly overseas, it's a very, very high rate, high busy market. In the winter months, it's much lower. So that £100 was my top rate for a room. Um, but most weekend breaks, so if you went off with your partners or you went off for a weekend trip, you'd pay about £70 bed and breakfast for the night, of which some of that was commissionable. And in those days, people mentioned online travel agents now chewing commission in hotels, but actually the distribution then could be up to 30% commission with some of the travel agencies. So we would only net less than £100 anyway. So on this particular day, one of the girls came flying out of the office very excited because she'd had an inquiry for all her bedrooms for Saturday night for £100. So you can imagine she was really excited. £10,000 booking in the bag until she saw my face. So anybody any idea what might be going on in March in Edinburgh? Rugby. That'll be the one. And not just any rugby, <coughs> it was the French rugby. Now I had never worked the Edinburgh market before, but I'd worked the Dundee market. And even in Dundee, we got busy. I mean, no, who goes to Dundee to watch the, you know, the match in Edinburgh? But it was so busy. So what she was excited about, I mean, as I say, I learned other skills. My personal skills improved over the years. So I had a touch of the Gordon Ramses and said, you can get your backside back in that office and get rid. It wasn't confirmed. Because what I wanted was three night booking for 100 rooms at 100 pounds. So what I wanted was a 30,000 pound booking, not a 10,000 pound booking. And what I also wanted, was I wanted the added spend, I wanted a package, I wanted the lunch at £10, and I wanted the dinner at £15. And those rooms took two people, so I wanted that times 200 people a night for three nights. So that was another £15,000, and that's not you know, including the pints that they drink and the beverage and the spend. So I wanted the business for £45,000, and she just took an inquiry for £10,000. So it wasn't a game, what it was to me was a loss of £35,000. And that was one inquiry. Suddenly, whose fault was that? Whose fault was it that that girl took that book out? That was my fault. Because I didn't have, and my managers didn't have, any kind of pricing strategy in place. But had I not been there that day, had I been somewhere else, we would have had a £10,000 book out, and the backsides would have been kicked come March, when the boss was saying, how come everybody else is coming on Friday? Why are we empty? Why are we not sold our bedrooms? So that was us. And from that moment on, I made sure that I had a pricing strategy that was not just in my head, but it was related to the rest of the team. So that's when I discovered I actually had a bit of a skill. If I can ask you now, for a quick show of hands, how many people here would say they spend an hour, two hours maybe a week on social media? So Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, that kind of thing. Quite a few of you? Okay. How many of you spend, <laughs> somebody in the room spends a lot more than that, <laughs> How many of you spend an hour to two hours a week on your pricing strategy? A couple, yeah, you're not allowed to count today. Okay. So what it is, 
is that that's what tends to happen. Now, social media is great, and it's part of it, but price is also part of it. And all I'm hoping today is just to maybe take a little time and spend a bit of an hour just to think about the concept. Okay, so what is a pricing strategy? <coughs> Have anybody heard of four P's of marketing? Yeah? Okay, so it's one of them. So what we've got is we've got promotion. So we're used to that. So social media, if we had a cake for promotion, social media would be part of that, and rightly so. But it also includes sort of adverts, different types of campaigns that you use to promote your products. The place, where do your customers buy? Where are they communicating and where are they buying currently? <coughs> product, that's kind of obvious. What is it you're selling and or service? So is it a product or is it a service? Final P is price, and that's what I call your marketing mix and money maker. Because the others, yes, they stimulate demand, and yes, they cost you money, but your price, that's where you put the pound sign on, and that's what makes you money. And once you've added price, without it, it things can be lost forever. So like my Edinburgh story, it can be lost, and it's never to be retrieved once you've passed that stage. Some of the things to consider when you're setting pricing strategies is the cost of it's a really silly little word, but it's huge. Um, but if you don't look at your cost, now I'm from hotels, and the number of people I go in and see, and when they say to me, I just charge my meals the same as the guy up the road, or I just charge it at this, and they haven't actually worked out the costs involved. Yes, that might work, but I think you'd be better off in control uh, of it than cost. And if you're dealing with products, it's vital. Um, service, you can sometimes get away, but products, you really have to. The market. What does the market look like, your market, um, currently, in the current situation? Um, is it a healthy market? Is it something local? Is it national? How does it look? And how does that sit with your competition? How does your competition look like? And also you need to have a little think about your customer limits and your customer's perceptions. Because we all have sort of ceiling prices and we all have limits. So again, when you're setting your pricing, you need to bear that in mind. So it isn't just one thing, set the same as the guy on the road. That's your competition. But will the market take you? Does it make sense? We're going to have a little look at is some of the different types of pricing strategies. Um, a lot of these, I didn't know the names of. When I set up, I didn't know half the things that I was, I was using. But realised over the years, once I started to look into a bit more detail than I did, so it doesn't matter that you don't know what it's called, but what you realise is that you're already using quite a few different pricing strategies possibly in your environment already. Okay. Most, cost, uh, most pricing strategies are one of two. Generally, it's either cost plus pricing that you'll use, or value-based pricing. Mostly, if you're using services, services tend to be value-based, and products tend to be cost plus models. Within a cost plus model, you will also have some people who operate a full cost model, including all variable and all, all operating costs. And then you'll have others that just use the variable cost. But whatever it is, you come up with the cost of something, you apply a margin, and then that's what you sell at. And when I said about it making sense and customers' perceptions, it's only when you make that calculation suddenly, you know, that jar of chutney that you've just produced is going to cost somebody £15 because of the ingredients. Now, is somebody going to pay for that? The answer is probably no. So you need to go back to the drawing board. So sometimes once you've worked it out. In a hotel, um, examples of that would be that in the food and beverage department, we had to maintain. So we'd be set by head office. You've got to hit the 75% GP on your food and beverage, just like very silly thing. So you can do that with a lot of things, and you can apply that to your standard meals. But then suddenly you buy something like a bottle of champagne, you can't apply that kind of ratio to a bottle of champagne unless it makes the cost of that to the consumer astronomical and it doesn't make sense. So sometimes things will be higher, make more profit, so you'll have some certain leading products that can be more profitable um, and then you'll have other ones that won't hit that margin. But the cash profit of a bottle of champagne, even on 50% margin, is worthwhile having and I wanted that, so I would reduce that price quite happily. The value-based pricing is somebody like me, I'm value-based pricing. I have my laptop and I've got my car and a bit of advertising and marketing. And then there's me. And what you've got with me is you've got a, a series of drawers of information in my head over the years. I've got all these little filing cabinets going on in my head and how they come um, as I speak to my clients as consultants. Um, but another example would be something like a CD. 
um, or a DVD. So you know, at the head of a magazine, you know, you have a free CD for twenty five, or you buy your mates and that's you know, ten pounds <coughs> free or like a pound that you know. Or you might go and buy the latest DVD, so it's ten quid in the shops. Or you also might buy a how to CD that teaches the whole of Microsoft Office in one fell swoop. That piece of plastic costs the same to produce technically. It's only a file or a piece of plastic. However, the value of what's on that plastic is what you're paying for. And that's sometimes a hard calculation to make um, because you've not got something specific to work from. And then you do have to look at other things. Well, another one that's used fairly regularly. Has anybody used one <coughs> Yeah. Have you found that useful? So again, in hotels, we would often use loss leaders. So it's when you either place something at a very low price or a low cost, um, sometimes of no cost to the individual, but in order to increase other sales. So I used to work in a really sort of um, very down-to-work, you might say, hotel, um, three-star pushing it, um, but we had a really busy weekend trade, pub trade. So I put on what we used to call lobby in uh, Lancashire, which is a bit of stew, on the bar, and the lads would come in, and they'd have the lobby, and they'd then drink five pints. So my loss leader was my bowl of stew, because they'd drink. But they wouldn't buy five pints if they had to come home from work because they'd be starving. So they'd head home, and they might not get out. <laughs> they were on that. <laughs> they might not get back out. So, and sometimes women, actually. However, I might also do in the restaurant. I might be trying to entice diners in. So I might do a free bottle of wine with four diners, or six diners. So it makes it attractive. So my loss is then on my drink, but I'm gaining four to six diners who can experience it and then possibly come back again. So it's quite good to get into a market and grow a market. Um, but again, work it out. Don't do it ridiculously, just give things away. You know, a free cup of coffee, people will have it and go. So it needs to link with other things that you can do. use market-oriented pricing when we first start, I think, uh, because we do, when you first set up a business and you first start a new company, what you do is an awful lot of research on the marketplace and your competition. And what that does is it gives you a far more informed way of making decisions. If I were doing market research on all of the hotels and deciding where to place a hotel, yes, I would do that, um, but that doesn't mean I have to follow what the market research tells me, but what I do is I make an informed decision and I think we all fall into the trap of doing that initially, but forgetting to go back and continue to do regular market research. And when we said about charging the same as the guy up the road, how do you know that what he's charging is the right for the market? So, can you hear me in the back with the drilling? Yeah. <laughs> Penetration pricing um, is very similar. It's basically when you get a very low initial offer. I joined a gym last year. And it did that. It offered you a very low price, something like $12.99 a month for life, if you joined before a certain date. So they were a new gym. They were trying to penetrate the market, and they needed to come up with something good. So I knew when the price was going up, and my decision to buy was then factored in. <laughs> my decision to buy was then factored in, um, so that, yes, the price did go up, and yes, but I bought it, and I could have that price for life. So if you've got it in a new market and you're trying to attract new business, it's certainly one to have a look at. Price discrimination. Again, used a lot in hotels. It's when you have a varying price for the same product or service. Now, hotels do this a lot. Um, airlines do it a lot. So room 101, for example, in a hotel would not be the same price. Surprise, surprise, all the time. So Monday to Thursday, you might be a corporate client who's here on business in town, and you'll pay one rate. Or you might be here attending a local seminar or conference. And you might pay a different price. You might pay a, a residential package, so you'll pay a different price again. And then at the weekend, when you come and stay for the weekend, you'll pay a different price again. And then you might book a late room, and you'll pay a different price again. So nobody pays the same amount of money for room 101. And for you, you will have peaks and troughs in your business when there are times when your business is lapsing and you could look at doing alternate prices in alternate ways. People sometimes are quite scared of doing that because they don't want to put off the market. But say you ran a cafe, what's wrong with running a cafe that attracts a local trade?
trade, office trade for example. They're there first thing in the morning, they're there middle of the day for lunch and they're there afternoons. So you have these two gaps in between. So it's okay to offer a package for other people who you might entice in. It won't detract from your initial trade if they want to come they can participate as well. Sorry. So it's a good way of alternating prices for the same product or services. Premium pricing. Now premium pricing is when you would artificially set the, the price. You'll find companies like, you know when you buy the latest iPhone, so you will just got to have it. There's a lot of people who've just got to have it. Um, and so it isn't really worth that much more than the previous model. It's just artificially high and it captures the market. But if you're delivering a product or a service that offers that, there's no reason to take advantage of premium pricing. It's the norm. I bought a tent. Well, I did. My husband bought a tent. Um, and he said to me, we'll, we'll go camping. And I said, oh, I don't think I'm keen on that. He said, I've got a two-man tent. I'll pop it up in the garden and we'll see if you fancy it. And I went, save yourself a job. I'm not getting in a two-man tent in the garden or otherwise. I said, so if that's what we've got, I'm not going camping. So I said, I need headroom. I said, I need somewhere to sit. I need a fridge for the wine. I said, and at least I need red wine. It has to be just so I have to stand up and move, you know, and I need rocks. So off he went to look for a tent, a no beasties. So I got a no beastie tent, which was marketing for the 2013 model at £750. <laughs> so he didn't think that was, you know, he thought it was a bit expensive. So we went for last year's model, which was half the price. So my hubby rang up and said, can you tell me? can't see what the difference is. Can you tell me what the difference is? And the difference, the 300 and odd quid, which you know the trip wires, as I like to call them, what are they called? Yes. That'll be them, I call them trip wires, because that's what <laughs> happens to me. So all them, and it was the quality of those that improved. And I just said, well, we just replaced them. Because <laughs> I'll be tripping over them constantly anyway. And that was the only, and because all it was, it was old stock and the new stock was artificially highly priced. So don't be afraid, afraid to try it. Psychological pricing? Does everybody know what psychological pricing is? Anybody got an idea? Basically, it's just when people put a, a price on, so $99.99 rather than £100. So psychologically, you know if somebody asks you the question and asks you to do the sums, then it isn't actually any different at all. But you psychologically think it's different. Um, and it isn't simply because you're using a number seven. What it is, it just differentiates and you don't think about it, you just see it as cheaper or you see it as different. Um, and it's just part and parcel of what we do. Dynamic pricing. I used to have to do all this by hand <laughs> in hotels. Um, if you've ever been on a flight, you're just about to book your flight online and it was £122. And the next minute you press the button to refresh the screen, it's now £173.16. That's dynamic pricing. And um, with moving forward with things like with IT, people have got massive systems now <coughs> to monitor demand. So the airlines were early early winners in this. And they would monitor, um, it was about the demand on their aircraft. And it was when cheap airlines came on board, the big airline companies had to compete. So what they did was compete on some of their seats. So they were able to monitor demand and apply pricing strategies around that. Other companies then, like hotel companies, then started to, to use things like that. So that's my background, that's what I did, is I was a revenue manager. And I used to have to sit and monitor my demand by pulling off reports every day. So what's the pickup? Right, we've moved 120 beds this month. What days have we picked up? Do I need to adjust my pricing strategies? And I do it all manually. And aren't they lucky? They can just do it at the fingertips. So you probably see it on things like Amazon. Your supermarkets use it. Um, constantly price changing. They know exactly what everybody else is charging. And it's not just about demand either. It's about buying habits. You know, you can't go on anything now, can you? And it's telling you what you've just looked at. And it's reminding you constantly on that site what you've just looked at. They know what your buying habits are and they teach you that they're all around. But I'm glad. I did work in one hotel where they had um, a revenue machine. So it told me how many rooms I was going to sell six months on Tuesday ahead. God, I loved it. It's exciting because you can trust it. So it was parallel to me and my brain after all these years, and it took me ages, but I was so excited because it really did know what it was doing. It didn't understand groups because that was chucking it out of the mix. So if I got a conference or something for 40 people, it couldn't cope with that. But actually, I could cope with that extra little bit of work, and eventually I began to trust it. Not 100%, but I did begin to trust it. And freemium is a fairly new one. My hubby, when he does all my spell checks for me, he said to me, have you made this up? I said, no, I have not made this up. It's a real thing. 
Does anybody know about premium? Yeah. It's basically when you have, has anybody used things like SurveyMonkey or MailChimp? And you have the freebie bit, but then you're enticed possibly to move on to the premium product and you pay them monthly or extra apps. You get quite a lot of apps where you get a freebie. I use a mind mapping app called Simple Minds, <coughs> no pun intended. Um, and it, I loved it, it's the way my mind thinks, so I used it, but then I wanted to email it and I wanted to print it. Well, I couldn't do that, so I had to buy the app. So uh, that's premium pricing. So you can tease somebody in and everybody is then your best referrer. They think it's a great product. You know, there's certain things that I like, like that Simple Minds because you just want it, it's a great product, but people will tell people about it because it's free, but then you decide whether you want to step it up for you. And then once you know it exists, then you can look at the competition. <coughs> so those are just a few price things. Um, and like I say, you might not know they exist by word, but you've probably used quite a lot of them. Has anybody recognised <coughs> their own pricing, current pricing in that? Yeah. What I'm going to do now is you all look scared. So what we're going to do now is we're going to play a game. So we're going to play the price tag game. Now, when I do the course, I sometimes get into a bit of Jesse Jane and start singing. It's not about the money, but I'm not going to do that for you today. But what I'd like you to do is have a little think about um, a price tag. So if I can ask you, just to bear with me, I'm going to ask you to feed back what's coming into your mind. So maybe if you can close your eyes if you want to. You don't have to, but I can't. I'm quite visual, so I quite like to look up and have a look at my eyes. But you've turned up at a hotel. You know nothing about it. It's £25 for that hotel. So can I ask you, what do you think you've arrived to? Just by shout out words. What does it look like? Budget. 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 What does it look <coughs> like? Shabby. Shabby. Cheap. Cheap. Okay. What are the windows like? Need painting. Dirty and what? Need painting. Need painting. Okay, what can you smell when you open the doors and you walk in? Dusty carpets. Sorry? Dusty carpets. Dusty carpets, yeah. Sticky beer carpets, all sorts of things. That's not question what you said then. <laughs> um, what's the food like? Does anybody want to eat here? No, <laughs> no, not fancy it. Okay, and what do you think the staff are going to be like here? Students? Are they going to be happy? No. Okay. So, let's have another think. Rub that one out. Right, you've arrived at a hotel. It's £175 now. So, you've arrived at the door. What does it look like outside? What can you see? Flowers. Flowers? Marble. Marble? Car park. A car park. <laughs> okay, and what does its signage look like in its windows? Clean. Yeah. Consistent signage. Yes, the sort of a brand image kind of thing. Yeah. Okay, what can you smell when you fling those doors open? Coffee. Coffee? Yeah. Polish. Pardon? Polish. Polish. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. And what's the food like there? Do you fancy having something to eat in this one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Have yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. some of that. Have a bit of that, yeah. <laughs> and what are the staff like here? Very much Clean and polished. It's that polished smell again. <laughs> so they're discreet. probably discreet. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Trained, probably. Yeah. Again, branded, probably. Badge smiling. Yeah. Okay. So just with a price tag, we've decided that 25 quid is, you know, cheap, damp, shabby, all those kind of things. Um, but it could be that they're running a lot of leader <coughs> promotion at the moment. And they've done something really cheap. Just haven't communicated it maybe very well. It could be a bargain budget hotel, hence it could be very clean and tidy, but it could be just less services. If you've been, you know, like nowadays you get travelers, there's no phone in the room, there's no breakfast, nothing, but it is clean and tidy, most of them. And then the other end of the scale, it could also be underpriced. It could be that 25 quid actually, it's actually quite nice. They've just got their pricing on, they've panicked and underpriced themselves. The other end of the scale we, we see as I, I see as luxury or higher end, fresh, clean, staff attentive, all that kind of thing. But again, what if there's no difference in the product? What if they're just overpriced? What if they're rugby and they thought, I know what we'll do, we'll chat them for the money. We'll put the price up for the French rugby and actually it's only worth £25. But what you have without any other, you've not been on TripAdvisor, you've not asked anybody, you've just all made assumptions based on price. So your price 
or whatever it is you're selling and promoting has quite a major impact. If it isn't going with all the right messages, then that could be a problem. So when we looked at the four Ps before, quite often when I talk about pricing with people, they drift off and they go, oh sorry, we drifted into marketing. Well, pricing is marketing. And it's normal because sometimes you get to the end of it and you think, actually, my pricing is okay. Actually, I'm all right there. It's not the pricing that's the problem. But maybe your four Ps aren't in alignment, they're not in that nice neat circle. One thing's saying one, and the other one's saying something else. So 25 quid, it's not 25 quid. You should be charging more for that hotel, which is why you're turning customers off. Okay, so pretty much what that showed was that our natural thing is that low price we see as low perceived value, and high price we see as a high perceived value. That doesn't mean that that's true. What are the risks then of too high price? If you put your price, I don't mean a high price, I mean too high. What kind of risks are there to your business? Sorry? Customers leaving. Customers leaving, yeah. Bad Why feedback. Bad feedback. Why would they feed back? Well, they would tell someone else that, that it was overpriced. So. They're expecting high standards. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The anticipation, isn't it? When you pay a high price, you have a very high expectations. So it's great if it's in balance. But if, if it isn't, you will lose sales and people won't come back because if it doesn't meet their expectations, there will be a, a problem. So it can create complaints. And also what happens with that is if you get a lack of repeat, all that process that you've taken all this time, you say is the easiest customer is the ones you can keep. So the last thing you want to do is get people through your door and then turn them off and have them not come back and have to try and find a whole new lot to come back through that door. And it will damage your reputation long term. What about the other end of the scale? If the price is too low, what can happen? It can scare people off as well because they don't even try them. Yeah. So yeah, it can scare people off, sorry. I was going to say, you could lose customers because they know it's the same thing really. Yeah, so they think it's cheap, so they don't buy. Yeah. What can be, What else could happen if it's well, only really cheap? Sorry? You can't actually deliver your promise, it's just not able, just not able to do it within that price and make a profit at all. Yeah. Yeah, and what did you say? Lose money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if, it, if it's actually costing you money, you can lose money. And equally, yeah, because it, it's costing. But also, what you can do is you can also stimulate demand sometimes to extreme. Mm -hmm. If it's so cheap and everyone comes flocking in, then what if you can't deliver? That will seriously affect if you've not done your costings. But also, what if you operationally can't deliver what you promised? Again, it, it, the same result would be would be a loss of repeat business and a damaged reputation. So that too high, too low situation just continues. So I know it, I, I call it sort of Goldilocks, you know, you don't want it too high, you don't want it too low. It needs to be just right. And that just right bit is the hard bit, um, trying to find the right balance um, between it. And what you won't do is you won't find it if you don't try it. And you, you need to record the data as well. If you, if you run a promotion, quite often people will say, well, we did that. I don't know if you worked with it. Well, we tried that. Yeah, we've done that. Um, thinking, well, maybe you did it, but maybe it was the wrong time, or maybe it was something else. One of my clients once said to me, I did do a promotion once, Denise, and all that happened was everybody who had already booked with me booked with me at 10% discount. And I said, well, then that was the wrong offer. I said, what did you offer them? Just a flat 10%. She said, yeah. I said, well, you need to direct them to where you want the business. So it would be an off-peak date, you book it by a certain date, and you have to put parameters around it. And then they will see it as a deal because then you'd be able to actually give them a better discount. Their clients you've already got in the bag and have to pay full price in the summer and loved it and want to come back. So actually they know the value of what they're getting, but what it is, it's like the loyalty thing. But then they come in the off-peak month, so January, February, March, not then, um, during the rugby. But they come at off-peak times and, and, and entice them in that way. So you, just because you've tried something, don't be frightened to try it again. In hotels, we used to always keep what we call the weather report every day. And it wasn't just for the weather. Um, it'd be just rain, 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 wouldn't it, at the moment? Um, but what we did was we recorded everything. Yes, the weather, but how many cancellations <coughs> did I get today as a hotel? How many bookings on the day did I get today? What was my rate? What was my occupancy? What was going on in the city or town? What was going on in the hotel? So that after, when you think, why were we so busy? Trust me, you'll never remember a year down the line unless it was major. You know, if you were during the Olympics, you'd know it was busy because the Olympics were on. But what else? What, what affected your demand? And people often
I mean, well, that's massive, but actually it's just an A4 piece of paper that people scribbled off and popped in a file. And junior members of staff used to keep it up to date. But when I was then forecasting my decisions on what my rate strategy would be for the future, I'd go, I couldn't really busy that. Oh, do you remember that was such such a conference on at GMEX? Or that was such such a conference on at Snowfield? They'd throw all that at me, so my staff were able to inform me what was happening because we couldn't afford that very expensive IT system of dynamic pricing. So, pricing needs to make sense. Um, as I say, it's all good and well doing all your customs and your calculations and coming up with something, but if it doesn't make sense to your customers in whatever way, how it falls with the competition, there's no point pricing yourself the same as a five-star property if you're not a five-star property. I w one of my clients once said to me they couldn't understand how next door was busy. Um, so I showed her next door on the internet. I couldn't understand why she'd never done that before. And I said, right, okay, what does it look like, Julia? It's better than mine. Let's look at number one on TripAdvisor. What does that look like to you? Oh, it's lovely. It's better than mine. Okay. And next door is better than yours. Okay. Who do you think isn't as good as you? Okay. So she brought it up. Mm. <laughs> but they don't have private bath. I said, okay. So do you think you could upgrade the standard of your room slightly to compete? Do you see now what's wrong with your bed? Because it's hard to walk into an independent hotel and say, do you know what? Well, that is ringing. Because they've, they've done it themselves very different in corporate. I don't walk in a hotel and do the Alex Polizzi bit and say, this is filthy, get it sorted. You can't do that in a with a private client. They've probably decorated that themselves. They possibly think that's okay. So what you have to do is find other ways. Um, but she couldn't understand. But after that, she suddenly realised that her rooms just didn't look as good. And that was her customer's buying point, was online photographs. So if that's where her marketplace was, her P, that was what was wrong. She needed to look at where they were buying, what they were seeing, and what journey. So they didn't have no a price tag. They had a price tag and a photo, but the photo wasn't good. So actually, that was more detrimental than what you've just done, which was no photo at all. Appropriately placed in the market. Always think as well, and that, that personal thing is that anybody in the room here look at the costs of their business. Hands up. Don't be surprised if you flip it on its head because your sales and your price are your customers' costs. They've already done your competitive analysis. They've already shopped around. They probably know more about your competition than you and are ready to negotiate when they talk to you. So see that, that when they're driving you, that if you'd ask for three quotes before you progress with a piece of work, don't be surprised if they do. And then when they don't take you up on it, find out why. So listen to your customer. And when I say listen, whether it's written word or whatever, hear what it is that they're saying because there'll be clues in that as to why they're not buying from you and why they're buying up the road. So again, girls in the conference office who used to work with me, they used to be like, oh, there she goes again, ring them back, why have they cancelled? So a conference for 40 people, I need to know why they've cancelled. What have we done? Um, so they would ring them and they'd find out they've gone to a competitor. Can we find out why they've gone to the competitor? Is it, is it based on price? Is it based on specifics. So quite often it might be something operational that they needed that we didn't have to offer, but we needed to know the reasons why. So when you don't convert, don't get disheartened, don't take it to heart, but try and find out what it is. And then be honest with yourself with that information, because quite a lot of people can take things personally themselves, you know, some you win, some you lose. But there's generally a reason why it doesn't go ahead, and it, it isn't necessarily your fault. <coughs> so if you listen and you find out something you can do better, it is your fault, you can do something about it. change the way you look at things and the things you look at can change. You need to just flip it on its head and look at it from the customer's perspective. Mm -hmm. Any questions? <coughs> Go on. Benny? Go on. Um, you were talking about gathering information, you know, feedback from the customers, you yeah. know, reporting and filling out Paralysis by analysis. I think if it takes you forever to analyse, you're never going to do it. But I think if it is a simple part of your daily, if it's, I'm, I'm not someone who creates systems, I'm someone who gets rid of systems. The simplest way of getting the simplest information 
home is right. But yeah, if you take the time, I mean, I have clients who would just say, I know they won't do it as much as I love it. I don't do it. I used to have massive spreadsheets and forecast materials. I'm me. It's just me, myself, and I. What am I going to do with all that stuff? So I have a really simple marketing plan. I have a really simple um, financials because I don't need anything else. I love it. When I was in industry, in the hotel industry, I had to have it at that level because that's what I was paid for. We were chugging along on a bit of an increase, a bit of an increase. It needed that analysis to take us to the next level, so it was needed. But that was my role. But yeah, I think you have to weigh it up against the value it's giving you. And if it's taking you too long to do it, it's either not simple enough, um, or possibly, like you say, you'll never get to use it because you're too busy running your business to be able to keep up with Jane. So yeah, good point. It has to be in the balance. To what extent is it okay to experiment with pricing? When you, we're in new, very new business, and I mean, for example, we haven't even done a website live yet, but pricing for what we offer will be on the website. And I don't know whether it's more dangerous to get it wrong at the get-go and possibly learn over time and change your pricing over time, because we're trying to reach a market that to some extent isn't there because the other competitors probably charge too much. I think it's okay to experiment with pricing straight answer on that one. You have to think about the implications of um, of that pricing. So maybe when we talked about having different prices, so you can test certain types of the market. So depending on who you're, who you're targeting, yeah. you could test pricing on individuals. Yeah. Um, and definitely some market, we said market research, what is it that's separating you that allows you to have a different price strategy from them? So again, you do the market research and you decide, well, I'm gonna give it a go. Prices change. If you put a price and a one-off price, and the hotels, we have a big umbrella price called the rack rate. Nobody hardly ever, apart from the French rugby, pays that rate. But that's my top rate. So times when there's high demand, that's the top rate. The Olympics, for example, there was cases where they were doubling and tripling their rates. That's just, that's not acceptable. You have a rate and understand, and all that happened with that was people didn't buy. And then they panic sold at the last minute and ended up with less what we call rev part, the revenue in the bank, that they would have had had they set a sensible pricing strategy in the first place. So there was a lot of issues about that. So we had a bull rate and then we would look at our markets and each of those <coughs> markets would have their own rate because they'd buy in a different place. Mm. So not understanding enough about what your business is, but by all means, I'm, I'm standing to sit. Okay. Come and grab me if you want and chat a bit, chat, chat a bit more about it. That's really really good good thank you. How can you compete with the national chains when it comes to restaurant pricing and stuff on the discounts they offer? Um, I think then you differentiate in what you offer, um, the product and the, the service that you offer, because national chains don't often get it, you know, they always get it right. Um, I was in a restaurant last week, it was a national chain, and it was just appalling yet again. So I won't be going back. I generally prefer to go to independents myself um, because they have more personality. Um, but yeah, they've got massive buying power, so you're not necessarily going to ever be able to compete on price. So you have to compete on the quality of the products and the services that you offer. So that, and as far as a restaurant's concerned, people have to want to be there. It has to be a nice ambiance, like it's going to be warm, it's got to be comfortable, it's got to be relevant to the type of client you're trying to attract. And everything's got to match. Um, when it comes to, to food-wise, we know we're better with them with the food. How, how much value is in the service? A lot, I think. Uh, yeah, a lot. Service, um, quite often, uh, national companies have the custom, you know, they'll have a big flip field for a training and they'll all go through all the training, won't they? And they'll have lots of training. Um, but it isn't always then cemented at work with the right ethos. So I, I could have a completely different way. I'm very customer driven. But I could have another general manager of another hotel who they think customers are a pain in the backside. We've both been through the same courses, but what you get is very different. So it's how it's then, you know, how it's then dealt with. What you can differentiate is that your passion can come through your team and they can they can accept and, and they can buy into what it is you're trying to, to deliver. And there are lots of examples of very good um, customer service. I had a brilliant weekend in a place down near Lancaster this weekend and Hubby didn't know, because he's not in the hotel industry, he's an engineer. And he booked it because it was near Lancaster and he said it looked alright. <laughs> looked alright. And then he said it was a bit expensive. He said, I thought it was expensive when I saw it and then I realised it was the person. Double the price, but it was seamless from the minute we arrived to the minute we left. I could have bought it, and, I, and it's expensive. But do you know what? It isn't because 
what we got was just fab. It was just relaxed. And I think when people walk away and they're not worried about the amount of money, you've not extorted it from them. But what you've done is you've charged them for the right quality. That kind of player will come back. And if you compete with those national chains, potentially you're competing with a whole different market anyway, if that's not who you want in there.